Hi everyone! Here is my in-depth look at Windowpane by Opeth. I listened to my first Opeth piece a few days ago and it was Windowpane and I ended up spending quite a bit of time with it as I was thinking through the music and and the interpretation and, and all of these things that go along with that piece of music. And I also did, of course, some reading about the band, about the musical style, even what people, how people view this particular song and what they think of it. And it surprised me a bit because I found that a lot of people think of this as being a very dark, heavy, um, even, even depressive piece of music and it didn't strike me that way at all personally. Even one of my longtime supporters on my channel who has been with me from almost the beginning and I, I have grown sort of attached to her, Helen is her name, um, she, she commented on my Patreon page that she had never listened to Opeth before because she had always had the impression that they were a very heavy, dark band. Well, this particular piece of music doesn't strike me as being dark at all. I don't think of it as being depressive. It certainly doesn't feel cold to me, doesn't feel harsh, and I don't even think of it as being heavy. Yes, it is melancholy sounding, and I, I, I make a distinction between depressive and melancholy. It is very melancholic, very mellow as well. It kind of strikes me as a sort of rainy day mood. Foggy, a little bit gray, um, overhanging clouds, misty. Yet at the same time, it's warm. It has, it has a sort of embrace to it. Like, kind of like pulling a soft blanket around you or drinking a cup of hot chocolate by the fireplace on one of those gloomy winter days. Another thing that I spent some time with on this song were the lyrics, and I didn't intend to spend so much time with them. But again, I was struck by a lot of people's common interpretations of the lyrics. So many of what I, the comments I found online as I was doing my research, people were saying, it's about a ghost, or many of them said it's about child abuse and an abused child that somebody sees looking through a window. And I could not get myself to view it that way. I tried because I wanted to try on the idea and see if it was really true, but it doesn't fit to me. I can't relate to it in that way because the music doesn't give me that kind of feeling. I tend to think about it more like from the perspective of an onlooker. And in my imagination, I picture this person walking down a sidewalk in a melancholy mood, kind of a gloomy day, gloomy weather, but not bad, bad weather. It's kind of foggy, maybe it's misting, maybe a bit of rain. The streets are wet and everything is a bit sloppy, a bit soggy. And this person, of course, is warmly dressed and comfortable. They're not a miserable person. Who is this person in my imagination? For some reason, and I can't say exactly why, but for some reason, I think of this person as being a fairly well-to-do, middle-aged or slightly older businessman type but gentle and sensitive, and he has some troubles in his own self that he, that he, um, he feels, and he's just kind of walking along in a contemplative, uh, sort of absent mood. And as he walks along, he sees a face looking out an apartment window, and for me, the window is up several stories. I don't know why. I'm just telling you what comes to my mind. It's interesting how many people think of this face in the window as a child's face. But to me, it's an 
old person's face. In fact, at first I thought of it as being an old woman, an elderly woman. Well, as I went through the lyrics, I ran into a little problem with that because later on in, in one of the verses, it, it says he. And so then, of course, I had to shift my perspective to an elderly man's face, which also works. And for me, as I'm going through the first two verses, um, they are telling what this observer, this gentleman walking down the street, sees in the window and his first impressions. The next two verses which follow are the ideas which develop in his mind about this unknown individual. He's kind of, he sees this face and somehow it gets his mind turning and building an image of that person's experience in life, but it's based on what he perceives, the, the glimpse he saw of the older gentleman's face, and the imagined story of what his life must have been and what his experience is now. And then finally, the last verse, again, from, from my perspective, is this gentleman walking down the street, um, the observer's awareness of how his own perceptions come from his own experience, perhaps even his own fears, as if he himself is afraid of ending up alone, lonely, uncared for, due to the things that have gone on in his own personal life, his personal losses and experiences and, and so forth. Why do I interpret it this way? Because it's the mood the music sets for me. And there are even things within the music that help to color and paint this, this image in my mind. It's not the only image. It's not the only interpretation that's appropriate. But to me, the music sets a very inward-focused, melancholy warmth. And if I am trying to interpret it as the very common interpretation is, being about a child in a known abusive situation, I simply cannot get that picture to align with the musical setting. So then, both the lyrics and the music become rather trite and superficial and meaningless. They don't, they don't really work together. Of course, this is very subjective and every person's own experience and each individual is going to relate to this music and this kind of music in different ways. I can only tell how I feel about it. As far as I can find out, Opeth's members haven't provided us with any specific guidance or information about what, if anything, they had in mind when writing this song. Well, it's true. It was dedicated to Michael's grandmother who died while the album was being recorded, but that was after the song was already written, already composed. So her death wasn't originally the inspiration or reason for its creation, although it became linked to that in the recording process because of the circumstances and timing. So I do feel that we are free to interpret it in a way that is meaningful to each of us. There is other music which puts me in the same type of rainy day melancholy mood. And I'm going to mention some just so you can try them out, listen to them. It's very different from this piece as well, but still, it's the mood that strikes me as being similar. For example, there are, there's Rachmaninoff's Vespers. That is a, that is a work that I love. And it's, it's a long work. It has multiple portions, sections, and... You don't have to go listen to the whole thing, but I will put a link to one of the pieces in it right here. It's almost impossible for me to listen to Rachmaninoff's Vespers on a sunny, bright day. It simply doesn't fit. It's as if, it's as if the music requires gloomy weather to match its tonal mood or something, uh, uh, not fully lighted room. For me, 
the perfect environment to listen to it is something like, let's say, after a long day of teaching and I have an hour or two to drive home, it's after dark, it's winter, the road is wet, it's miserable driving weather, but it just has to be done and I'm riding along, driving along and, and going with it. I'm warm, I'm comfortable. I turn on this music and it literally wraps around you with its, with its mood and its colors. And it's warm at the same time, it doesn't clash with the environment. Another one that I very much enjoy, and in some ways it's more akin to window pane, simply because it has more jazz influence. And that is from an album called So Many Stars by Kathleen Battle. It's, it's an album of a sort of classical jazz traditional crossover style. And the entire album is lovely. And it's also much more childlike because it's basically a collection of lullabies, but it gives the same mellow, gentle, what I call the rainy day vibe. And so here's a link to one of the tracks from that album as well, which I hope you will enjoy just as something from my background and my experience. Now back to window pane. What is it? that creates this melancholy warmth and haziness in the music? Well, it's a combination of elements. First of all, we have the jazz style chords. Now, in previous videos, I have talked a good deal about simple harmonic design and basic chord structures and usages from time to time in relation to various songs. Now, this one is very much built off of jazz style harmonies and chords. And they use what we call a lot of seven and nine chords. I want to show you what that is, and I will in a few moments. Another thing has to do with the tone of the voice that's singing. It's sort of a fuzzy, hazy sound, very gentle. The instrumentation is quite gentle. There, it, are the warm acoustic guitar sounds. The bass is has a warmth and mellowness to it. The drums feature as more of a textural element rather than something that really drives and powers the piece. And then of course we have the obviously synth strings which again just fill out the tonality a bit in a soft way. There's also an avoidance of sort of tonal conclusiveness in the melody. And I will show you what I mean by that in a few moments as well. There is a lightly syncopated rhythmic pattern. And I, I say lightly because it's quite a consistent pattern throughout the music. And so this syncopation settles into its own relatively predictable feel. And once it becomes predictable, then we don't feel it so much as syncopated anymore. And then of course, we have the repetition of motivic figures to establish a sense of location identity. And finally, we have the guitar solos, which are incredibly expressive. Um, we could say that they're blues style. It's it's, they have this singing quality. And one little thing that I'm going to talk about in a few moments is that they are always set over the same rhythmic or harmonic material as came just before the solo. And I want to show you how that works in the music as well. So we have a lot to go through here. Let's start with the chords. Because these jazz chords are I'm going to say more complex because they have more elements. That doesn't mean that they're harder to understand. So for example, instead of having simply an F minor chord made of three notes, like say this one, and I can play that and it sounds nice enough, right? Now, if I count from the bottom F, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
All right, I'm going to play, I'm going to add that seventh note to this chord. And you see how suddenly it, it gets a different quality, sound quality that's much different than... This is a cleaner, um, simpler sound. That's a little bit more softened and complex of a sound. Well, we can add another note as well. Let's say instead of seven, I count up to nine, eight, nine. So I'm going to play this. And suddenly we feel as if we are in the jazz world. Or the impressionistic romantic French world as well, which you hear a lot of on the harp. So it's interesting that impressionist music, classical music, and jazz music have a lot of common tonal sounds to them. And this entire first section of window pane is built off of this specific chord, which we call a an F sharp nine chord, because I have the F sharp minor and I add the ninth note above F sharp. So we've arranged these, or let's say Opeth has arranged these in this pattern. hear that? That's the softness, the mellowing influence of this jazz style um, chord setup. And it's lovely, but to have an entire section of music built around that one chord adds a sort of hypnotic feeling. At the same time, the rhythm is keeping us awake and the harmonic structure is softening everything. It's a very very um, not unique but specific setup which gives us this sound and then when the voice enters we'll get to that in a moment we have this entire introduction to the music which is quite long built around this F sharp 9 chord and F sharp minor nine. Let me make sure that I specify that it's minor as well. And some variants of it as well. Then we get to the verse. The verse is built around the C sharp chord and its variants. And now this brings us to something else kind of interesting. Because again, I've spoken in, the, in other videos about how Music has a tonal center, a home, a tonic note. And we relate to that and we feel it and it gives us a sort of orientation and identity and way of relating to everything around the, that tonic. And then I've also talked about how the dominant, five notes up from the tonic, is our most powerful competitor within the music. And we can use it to balance to add power, to, to do all kinds of wonderful things in the music. But here, something really interesting happens. The entire introduction was set up around F sharp. And if I point to F sharp, that's here. Now, it's my black string. I'm going to point to this one. Hopefully it's more visible here. It's thicker. And this then is what we think of as being our tonic note, which means we feel that the music is beginning in the key of F sharp minor. But if I move up five notes, I end up on the red note, which is C sharp. And when the verse enters, we suddenly shift to C sharp as our chord identity. It's as if the entire piece of music changes its location. The way, it's, the way it works out, because the other thing that happens is that we end up with a, the C sharp nine, which is, has a D sharp in it. And that doesn't belong to F sharp minor. 
So it suddenly disorients ourselves. It makes it feel like, wait, what key are we in? And suddenly what we felt as being the tonic location, this area, suddenly begins to feel more like the four chord. And you've heard me talk in some past videos about the how the four chord gives a very gentle lift. And when we, we return from four back to one, it's a very gentle arrival. And there is this balancing act happening in this music between these two chords. And we can argue whether we're in one key or another key based on some little subtleties, which I won't go into because it's probably not that interesting unless you're really crazy into music theory. But I just wanted to point out that we have this center and then we have this center. And the music is going between those two a lot in large sections. The intro is here. The verse is here. And then we get go back to where we started. And it happens multiple times in the music. And so in this verse, we find ourselves in this C-sharp world. I'm just going to call it the C-sharp world. That's a good way of thinking of it. And the voice, the way it's sung, it makes it feel as if we belong in this C-sharp world and yet we don't arrive at this C-sharp world, at the C-sharp center for quite a long while. It gives it a sort of inconclusive, meditative, floating, not highly distinct, um, maybe we could even say aimless. I don't mean aimless as in having no sense of direction at all, but aimless and just kind of floating, meandering, wandering. For example, we start here. That's the main sketch of the melody, which happens again. And then as the verse continues, we find ourselves finally arriving here and it feels quite a good deal like home but this is our C sharp and so in this entire section we feel like C sharp is home even though we don't really settle there until kind of the last minute just before we go back to our F sharp world and this conclusiveness this arrival at C sharp in the verse is quite definite. You'll hear it. Or when you sing it, you'll feel it. That when we get to this note, it feels like we finally arrived. And we could even stop the song there and feel quite comfortable ending it in that moment. And then of course the music goes on and and it has some filler stuff, some chords, the synth strings. We're all still centered in this C sharp world until the very moment at which the first guitar solo enters. And magically, in this moment, as soon as the guitar solo enters, we suddenly feel that the conclusiveness, the point of arrival, is that first chord on the guitar solo, which is our F sharp minor again. And so this is um, just a, a really interesting way of setting up a piece of music where we're, we're being moved from one place to another and back again. And it's done in such a way that every time we move and we are set somewhere, we actually feel like we belong there. Now, so much of this song is set around those two chords that I've spent a lot of time on. But then we get to a sort of middle section and I'm going to talk about the setup of this song, the structure, the outline, the architectural design of it in a few minutes. 
But first, let me talk about this middle section, which I'm going to dub the echo section. And here's exactly why. Because we hear this sound, and then it's echoed. And you hear it multiple times. And it begins to drive itself into us, and we just live there. There are synth strings happening. There, there's a little bit of percussion. It's very peaceful, reflective. And then, just when we almost feel like we've heard it too many times, it shifts up just a bit. So then we hear a half step higher. Same thing, but it feels like there was just a little bit of brightness, or, or we've looked up, and we hear that a couple times. Maybe we're looking up at the window. And then we come back down. And that repeats several times. And so this echo section is the first part of what I'm going to call a mini sandwich right in the middle of the piece of music. And then we have this, not a full verse, but this sort of vocal, we could say bridge perhaps, that is sandwiched right in the middle. It's the middle of this echo sandwich. So we have the echo section, then we have the vocal part, and in it, it falls, the, the tonality of it follows the same general sketch of of sitting on this chord that was the echo section. And then for a moment, you'll hear it lift and then it returns. And then to close off our sandwich, to put the last piece there, of course, the instrumental echo returns. And so we have this little enclosed wrapped up sandwich right in the middle of the song. Now, the next portion does darken. This is the one part of the piece of music where it feels darker. It takes on almost a foreboding quality. I feel like it's as if there are maybe some dark clouds rolling in across the sky, but I don't think of it as being the outer sky. I understand it to be a turning inward. This picture of our onlooker and the way he's building in his mind the story, the imagined, his imagined story of this nameless person that he has seen through the windowpane, the assumptions he's made, the story he's built for his character, all of these coming from his own heavy loneliness, losses, fears, memories and life experience that he's carrying and he starts to turn inwards and that is the darkness that we feel in this passage of music and eventually as we pass through this part of the music the menacing foreboding quality lifts and and leaves again and we are left with this sort of melancholy reflective I'm going to call it pre-solo motif, which sounds like this. This is what the guitar starts singing in this, what I'm going to call pre-solo. And I call it pre-solo because then the guitar goes into what feels like a bona fide guitar solo. But here's what we hear beforehand, and it's stated very clearly, very gently, twice. <laughs> You'll recognize that melody. You could almost make a whole piece of music out of just that sweet, gentle melody itself. Now this melody is built off of two chords which support it. We 
have this chord and then we have this chord. And then when it goes to the slow part where it's going we have this chord here and then the same thing with the same chords and I want you to listen for that because then when we get to the guitar solo this particular chord sequence which was supporting the pre-solo is the exact same chord sequence which supports the guitar solo it's as if this guitar solo is built off of the exact same material. It's just elaborated upon and expanded and the guitar is singing this, this beautiful uh, melodic song to us that is simply supported by that same sequence. We could call it variation if you wish, but I feel like it's more than a variation. It's an expansion. And as I said, this, this pre-solo can is enough musical material, we could actually make an entire piece of music out of it. And I guess that's kind of what the guitarist is doing right here. He's taking that little bit of material and he's turning it into his own moment of music. And if you listen closely, you'll hear how the supporting instruments in this guitar solo section are playing the exact same accompaniment chords as we heard in the pre-solo. You can even hear the pre-solo melody filtering through in the background a couple of times. And then of course, as we come to the last two verses, we are brought full circle back to the beginning of the song, musically speaking, structurally, design, composition wise, it's as if the entire piece of music is one very large sandwich. I talked about the mini sandwich in the middle. Now we're talking about the entire piece of music. Or we could say that this song is almost a mirror image of itself. Its dividing point is right in the middle, that mini sandwich that I talked about. And just as the first half works its way in towards that center. So the last half works its way back out from the center, which is yet another reason why I think that we should at least consider the option of interpreting the lyrics as I do, as being a reflection of the onlooker in which he becomes the main character, even though at face value and first impression, it appears to be mostly focusing on the face in the window pane. And so with this in mind, here's a question. If you look at the penultimate verse, it talks about um, he is waving his hand goodbye. And I mentioned at the beginning that, that, that he made me picture this face in the window pane as an elderly gentleman rather than a woman. But now here's a question to explore. Is the he of his hand waving goodbye, is that the person in the window as we might first interpret it to be? Or is it a memory of something in the onlooker's past? Or is it perhaps even the impulsive wave of the onlooker himself towards that unknown or blank face. Blank meaning there's actually no knowledge of who this person really is and what his story really truly is. Well, of course, it depends on how the story develops in your own mind as we move toward the end of the piece and how this musical setup affects your interpretation of the text. But it's a question which brings multiple interesting ideas into view and Honestly, I'm still not 100% settled on it myself. 
which view makes most sense and feels right. But I am playing around with the possibilities, and if you enjoy this song, you might want to explore it yourself as well. In closing, the lyrics of the final verse strengthen what I find myself tending towards when looking at it from the musical perspective. Here is what they say. There is deep prejudice in me, outshines all reason inside, given dreams all ridden with pain, and projected unto the last. I feel like it's a sort of confession, an acknowledgement, a recognition by the onlooker that he has built this whole story in his mind. He has projected his own self onto this nameless face in the window based on his own personal experiences, hopes, fears. It's a beautiful piece of music with a special gentleness overall, which I feel like it asks us to look below the surface to see what else we can find there. I have enjoyed spending time with it, and I wouldn't be surprised if I return to it for my personal enjoyment in the future. And I'm very curious to hear back from you your thoughts on how it affected me, the way my interpretation grew and developed, and perhaps maybe you have something to add to it, or maybe you have a different perspective, which, as I said, is the way music allows us to be. I'll see you soon.